Welcome everyone to an open heart conversation. This uh, talk was organized by Chokur Ling. It's a Tibetan Buddhist center in Bangalore in India. And your hosts today are Aman and myself, Nicole. And our guests, we're very excited to have Tenzin Osalhita Torres with us today. And uh, he is an environmentalist, humanitarian, documentary filmmaker, musician, father, friend, lifelong student, and former Buddhist monk. When he was just 14 months old, Osal was formally recognized by His Holiness the Dalai Lama as the reincarnation of Lama Thupten Yeshe, the revered Tibetan yogi, scholar, and teacher. Osal was enthroned as the reincarnation of Lama Yeshe in 1987. In 1991, when he was six years old, he began life at Sarah J. Monastic University in South India. He lived and studied there until he was 18. Osal then decided to leave the monastery to explore modern ways of life and thinking. Osal served on FPMT's board of directors from 2008 to 2013 and continues to attend teachings with Lama Zopa Rinpoche and support the organization by sharing love, experience, and insight with the FPMT family around the world. So Oso, would you mind leaving us in an opening aspiration for our talk today? Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, so let us dedicate this time, this space, and this energy uh, in the next hour of change. Let's dedicate it so that it could be of benefit to as many sentient beings as possible to be able to find their true nature and in doing so, reach their full, full potential and be able to be liberated from samsara and help many others to do so as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Oselji, for coming for this talk. It's such a pleasure for our center. Oselji, the first question that I wanted to ask you is, which everyone would be wondering is, that the reincarnation was the talk of the town, especially the Buddhist town. And then you moving away at the age of 18 from the position of Lama to a modern layman and pursuing filmmaking, and, and you did those amazing things was a talk of even a bigger town, Buddhist and a non-Buddhist town. I just wanted to ask you that, how do you feel looking back at that time now? What are your thoughts on those times and how do you feel about it now? Uh, well, that was a very complicated time, actually. Uh, very complex. And actually, I didn't have much information either to really make big decisions like that. <laughs> So I really, for me, it was a big risk in a way, but I felt that I was, I had to do it because I, I think you regret more the things that you don't do than the things you actually do. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I had pretty clear. And, um, and I had already spent about 15 years in the monastery, you know, in, the, in, in India and in Switzerland, also in the monastery in Switzerland, another monastery in Austria also. Had, so about 15 years in Copan, it had been about 15 years I'd spent all together in a monastery as a monk. And I felt that maybe, you know, by the age of 18, I had, you know, independence. So I could make that decision by myself without really involving anybody else. So I took full responsibility and moved forward. It was uh, the first year was uh, hard, you know, because I still had doubts whether I had made the right decision or not. Mm. But uh, I've never really regretted it. You know, just really, for me, it helped to really understand um, like my purpose, my destiny a little bit clearer. You know, even though I was more lost than before, <laughs> but uh, I understood that I was maybe in the right path, maybe. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, about about the cinema, uh, basically, I had to find something to do, right? If I was not in the monastery, I had to do something. And I, always, I really enjoyed movies. Mm -hmm. But because in the monastery, movies were illegal. Wow. You know, you get punished if you watch a movie. Wow. So that's why, you know, that I had this passion for movies, you know. Also, Bollywood movie. <laughs> I know many songs, Bollywood songs. <laughs> My memory is still today, I can sing them, no problem. And uh, so I also thought that a movie is a very good way for communication. 
so that was a one of the main aspects of that choice was because it had the potential to communicate a lot in many different aspects of communication, you know. So poetic, you know, visual, audio, music, and of course the story, the inspiration, the actors, you know, there's just so many aspects. And I just think that's so interesting because uh, you can watch it anytime you want, as many times as you want, wherever you want, however you want. And that's very comfortable, you know, and at the same time it reaches, it can reach you. Like when I watched The Matrix, for the next week, I was questioning reality all the time. Mm. And Matrix is also an inspiration for me to, to study cinema. And um, so I didn't really do many, many things because a lot of the material I worked on, I lost somehow. Mm. <laughs> um, but the few things that I've done are, are available. And uh, so in the future, I'm hoping to do more. You know, I, I would really like to, to do much more. So anyways, that's in the future. Do much more in movies, you mean? Yeah. Mm. Documentaries, movies, series. Do you think a non-dharma practitioner, so that let's assume I've never been introduced to Buddhism, do you think in an ideal world, people could learn from the movies because there are such great movies made all over the world? But this question, it's, it's a trick question. <laughs> Actually, it's not about the movie. It's about you or about the person who's watching the movie. Mm. So it depends on the mind that's watching the movie of what you learn and how you learn and whether it's useful what you learn or not and how you put it to use. So it's a, that's why it's a trick question because it's not about the movie really. Mm. <laughs> it's about the spectator. The spectator. Mm. And, uh, but I feel that movies can be a great means to help people to understand complex aspects of, of their own life and put them in context. So people try to alleviate their daily suffering and depression by immersing themselves in their careers or their partners. Is there a problem with doing this? And what's wrong with the dream of having a stable job, finding a stable life partner, and then dying happily together? <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the last part is exactly what my grandfather is doing or did or is doing. I mean, he's, he had 75 years of marriage. Wow. And he, I used to always ask him, like now he's 94 years old and uh, my grandmother passed away a few years ago. So he's uh, a different, it's, this is a new stage of his life, you know, where he's living alone. But he's very active, very happy person, very active, very good memory. You know, still very independent. He lives alone. Um, and he used to, I used to always ask him, how did it last? So how were you able to stay? Because my grandmother had a lot of character. You know, she could be a bit toxic sometimes. And she was very like strict and aggressive sometimes or, or a lot of the times. <laughs> but you would have to know how to neutralize that, right? And my grandfather was the boss in neutralizing my grandmother. And uh, I think that was, it's such a magic, you know, it's like, it's actually a, a for my grandfather it was natural, it came natural. And uh, so I used to ask him how, how, why, how and why, you know, and he would say, say sometimes, uh, tienes que ceder, he would say, like, uh, means in Spanish, you have to let go, you have to give the victory. <laughs> you have to say, yes, yes, my love, you're right. <laughs> So it's the same thing in life as well, you know? It's about, in the ego, sometimes, you know, you, you cannot always let the ego win. You know, you have to take the victory for yourself, you know? In the sense, in the long run, it's not about what you want now or what's easier now. It's about, you know, in the long run, what's good for you, really. And many times we, we, we make the first choice because the, the ego wins. So sometimes you have to, to, to change that aspect. But um, the question is true, you know, exactly. That's when people, they try to alleviate the daily suffering and depression by immersing themselves in their careers or their partners. So this, this would be a perfect example of a bypass. 
or in Spanish, would, or like you'd say, um, to take refuge. You could say to take refuge, no? It's another word, possibly, which means in a way that you're trying to avoid yourself. You're trying to not have to challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what we're all doing most of the time. And that's why Dharma is essential, you know, because it's, it's basically about uh, us saving ourselves <laughs> from ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to save yourself from yourself. It's from nobody else. Nobody can harm you. Nobody can do really anything, you know, if, in the long, in the big picture, right? In the universal picture. Mm. It's only you who can harm yourself. So that's why it's about saving yourself from yourself. <laughs> Which is very ironic. Mm -hmm. You know, the irony of life is like that. Just like oxygen oxidizes you and kills you eventually, it also gives you life. You know, and it's the same oxygen. So it's not like black and white. Mm. Everything is just gray. We like to give that difference, that dualism, actually. Mm. So really, bypassing or taking refuge really represents that small, that small or huge issue in our life where we don't want to really challenge ourselves or take responsibility. Mm. We just want to run away from ourselves, like Bob Marley says. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why, yes, is there a problem in doing this? Yes, of course. I mean, that is the, the problem, right? It's not about, you know, your partners or your careers. You know, it's about, you know, really the interior that you have and how you manage it. So really it's about the, the perception and from the perception comes the attitude. So if we are able to change our perception, we can change our attitude. And we, if we change those two aspects, then it doesn't matter what career or what partner or where we are or anything like that, you know, because here everything is aligned, you know, so we are present. And then when we're present, it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, we are able to adapt in a positive way and that's exactly the tools are offered by Dharma, you know, mm -hmm. which is, a, Dharma is almost like a, a branch from Hinduism. Mm -hmm. You know, the Buddha, uh, originally he, he meditated, he was, uh, he was with the Hindus. And then afterwards he tried a different method or, or he just went by himself and then he started uh, Buddhism, you know, but the technique was always there. It's always been there. It's a universal technique. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like somebody comes and says, oh, look, I found the truth here. You know, this is for you. This is your truth. You know, take it. You know, it, it, it doesn't work like that. Each person has to walk their path. Each person has to learn for themselves. So it's not so much about the information available to you. It's about what you want to learn and what you want to know. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's. It's very easy to blame outside, you know, and, and give the responsibilities come to something else. So that's why, yes, it's a problem. So once we change that, then there's no, there's no problem in doing whatever it is that we're doing, you know, because it's not about not enjoying or not having a partner or not, not being ambitious in your career. Of course, you know, that all those are, are, are good things in a way, you know, but it's about your attitude within that aspect. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I think uh, that I answered the question, right? Exactly, yes. <laughs> so, but, okay, so that's all right, John. The, to run away from yourself and to run to your partner or to a career, that's just going to invite suffering. But is, how is that different if it is different to taking refuge in a guru, for example? The Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and most importantly, the guru. Ah, but that happens also in, in, the, in that aspect. That's why I also use the word refuge because people take refuge in religion or in a philosophy or in a concept or a belief or whatever it is for mm -hmm. self reassurance, you know, to feel that they are secure, that they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. 
but really they're avoiding to take responsibility of the true things, you know, because deep, deep down we know. There's no going around that. You know, many people say, oh, God knows. Well, God knows, obviously, you know. <laughs> so that's, uh, I think, uh, important to, to be aware of. It's, uh, in, in, of course, it's the um, religion or philosophy or the teachings of the Buddha, the knowledge, it helps us to understand better. But it's not something to, to grasp upon, to be attached you know, to the guru or to the teachings or to a concept, you know, just so that you can feel that you're doing something useful in your life. Wow. It's not about that. Then it becomes a bypass. It's not the real deal. You know, you don't want to put yourself in a box, you know, we already have elevators and cars and uh, apartments, you know, all these things. So why put ourselves in another box? Doesn't make sense. Do you think someone could choose to focus on a career, have a partner, children, and still observe and improve? How easy or difficult is that? <laughs> I think this, this, this question is a little bit um, the way it's asked, it makes it sound like it's a bad thing. As if a career, a partner, or even to have kids is a bad thing. <laughs> I wouldn't agree it's a bad thing. You know, it depends on how you do it. I mean, you can be a terrible parent, you know, it's up to you. Or you can be a great parent. It's not about having kids. <laughs> it's about, about your attitude in life. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you can always say, oh, I'm really stressed. I have too much work, I'm overloaded, this or that. You can invent a hundred million gazillion excuses not to have the right attitude because that's almost in a way it's, it's being a coward, you know? Because in the end, I mean, maybe we are cowards, I don't know. But I feel, you know, when we really take responsibility, then our life changes completely. And that's where we understand that it's not about, you know, these names, you know, these, these concepts of, of something. Because I mean, obviously, a career, we need a career in order to eat, you know. We need, I mean, a partner is important to feel warmth, you know, be able to, to, to exchange. I mean, because life is about sharing. Life is about um, growing together, about learning together, you know. So, it's an exchange, you know, it's, it's an interdependence. So obviously I think the, the partner aspect is important unless of course you really, really want to focus on your spiritual growth in that aspect, because it doesn't mean that if you have a partner, you can't focus on the spiritual growth. Mm. Depends again on the attitude that you have towards that. Mm. You know, having a partner could be much more beneficial than living in a cave listening to a, a, a drop falling all the time, you know, in, in your cave and being humid and having getting pneumonia in the end, you know, because you're really trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's not about, you know, these concepts, you know, it's really about your, your actual attitude in life every day, mm -hmm. especially under circumstances of great stress or great difficulty or great pain, you know, in these the situations, that's where really, you know, you are, you are actually able to, to get to know yourself and who you are. So, yeah, I think it's a great thing to have kids. And at the same time, it could be a terrible thing. So it's, it's, it's not about oh, a good luck or bad luck, as they say. You know, it, it, it's relative. It could be good luck, it could be bad luck. <laughs> It's, I'm talking about luck because there's a story about a, a villager who lives in a village. It's, it's a long story, okay? Well, relatively long. Yeah, about um, the time for that. <laughs> so he's living in the mountains and then suddenly a, 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 an amazing horse appears. I'm sure you've heard this story before. And he's a, a semental, like we say in Spanish, you know, a, a, a special breed, you know, pure, pure bread or whatever it is. That they're very, very like uh, special horses, a wild one. So he appears, and then um, so the the guy he he fences, he he puts the water and food. And the horse comes and he puts a fence, 
And then all the villagers are saying, wow, you're so lucky, you're so blessed, oh, you're so lucky. And he's like, oh, lucky or unlucky, you never know. <laughs> so the, the next morning, the horse runs away. Mm-hmm. Everybody's like, oh, that's so unlucky, it's so unlucky. And he's like, oh, lucky or unlucky, you never know. <laughs> and really the people are like, this guy's weird, you know. <laughs> so then four days later, or three days later, the horse comes back with another 40 horses. With the whole with the whole herd because he was like the alpha male so he went he found them and brought them back to where there was he found water and food so suddenly the guy gives all of them water and food and fences them and he has 40 new horses for free so everybody's like wow so lucky so lucky and he's like ah lucky unlucky you never know <laughs> so the next thing you know it's uh, uh his son tries to train this horse the wild horse and then he falls and gets trampled so the wild horse tramples him and many breaks many of his bones. So the, the son ends up in, in a very, oh, very injured in bed. So everybody comes in like, oh, so unlucky, so unlucky. It's like, oh, unlucky, lucky, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> and then next thing you know, the, the army comes and they're recruiting the, the young kids of all the families. And it's a very, very bad war, you know, where possibly most of them will die. So they don't recruit, they don't uh, recruit um, his son who's sick, injured. And they recruit most of the kids in the village. So everybody's like, oh, so lucky, so lucky, so lucky. He's like, oh, lucky and lucky, you never know. Mm. So anyway, that's how it goes, the story. It comes from a friend of mine who wrote a book called Nunca Se Sabe, which means you never know. Mm. That story comes from, from part of that book. You know, so I think it's very, very interesting, you know, that concept. Mm. Is we tend to always judge, you know, black and white, good or bad, and we get stressed on something that maybe it's not really that bad. Mm. And, uh, and we, we get overjoyed or idolize something that in the end maybe we end up being disappointed with. So it just helps to kind of ground us a little bit and be more realistic because being realistic helps you to be more happy in the end. Mm. It's not about being pessimist. Pessimist is different. It's projecting negativity. Mm. It's not about projecting negativity. It's about being realistic, you know? So expecting the best, but preparing for the worst. <laughs> so, Osilji, in your, in your blog and in your teachings, you, you continuously ask us to check, observe, and persevere to improve to continuously be aware, be mindful of your shortcomings and keep improving yourselves, get that strength. Mm-hmm. Osirdi, is there a common underlying issue that you're asking all of us to improve or you're asking us to look at a traumatic incident that has happened to you, that has shaped you as the psychologist would put it and then improve on that? I think each person has their own path and each person has their own difficulties and their own challenges and their own goals, you know. And also, eh, we have our own conditionings, you know, in circumstances, in childhood, blah, 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 blah. And basically, we are living the, 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 the result of, of, our, of, of one aspect of our karma. So we are actually living that. And uh, it's not somebody else's karma, it's our karma. Of course, there is a collective karma in which it does sometimes, you know, I mean, always involve, but don't get me into that because I'm not a very good philosopher. <laughs> um, but uh, I feel that we are responsible, you know, and the moment that we realize that we are responsible, uh, that's when really, and, and then of course, the first step is to be grateful, right? Because uh, we are living the love of the universe, you know, that we are receiving the love of, of all sentient beings in the, in the universe, we are, we are 99% microbe. So basically, we are 1% human. Mm. And believe it or not. So when we eat, we're not eating for ourselves. We're eating to feed the microbes in our stomach who eat that food. And then we, we receive the energy from that food. And that's how we are able to move around. But our body, our whole system is 99% microbe. I mean, there's one, maybe 1% actual human. So that's uh, the reality. The reality is that uh, we are walking universes or, or multiverses. Mm-hmm. 
composed by billions, billions, billions of, of sentient beings. Because amoeba, even though it's a single-celled animal, it does have a consciousness, I believe. It can be debatable, but I believe it could have some kind of type of consciousness or it's difficult to, to really think about it and, and debate on it because it's almost impossible to really confirm. I mean, how are you going to ask me about, yo, I know you like food and you're scared of something, but does that prove that you're conscious? You know, like, does that prove you have a consciousness? I don't know. It's debatable, I guess. Because there are plants also that, that open and close. And the Tibetans, according to Tibetans, you know, the, the plants don't have a consciousness. Mm -hmm. But then according to other people, they do. These are alive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the, root, the roots under the ground is almost like, a, like the internet. You know, they actually share nutrients. You know, when, when one tree needs, he just sends a message and they send nutrients to that tree to help him out. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's a very advanced system of communication. Um, I believe trees are, are alive somehow. I mean, I, I like to call them the stupas of nature. <laughs> so, yeah, anyways, going to the point. Um, we are not who we think we are. We believe we are. We are so, like, structured on me, 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 whatever it is. I mean, you, can, you can't really find that me. So the earlier you let go, the easier it is going to be for you in your life. Because your problems will become much smaller. You know, and you'll be able to help many more sentient beings if you're not so self-centered. And that will bring you much more happiness. So I highly recommend. <laughs> so uh, a depressed person on most days finds it hard to even get out of bed. And their mind could be in such chaos that they might lack the basic energy required to put effort into looking at the mind and working on it. And their mind is beating them up and they can't find a way out of it. What would you suggest for them? And where do you stand on seeing a therapist for coming out of depression? Well, depression, it, it, this is a very, very, very deep question. And I think we are all depressed in a, in a, in a way. We are depressed. So the, the time, I mean, because maybe you could, even, you could even say we are in samsara, you know? So maybe depression is part of samsara. But, of course, this very complex and deep-rooted problem that comes from depression, you know, and that's the lack of really understanding our mind. And I'm not saying that uh, depression is not uh, serious. It is very serious, you know, because there's very different uh, levels of, of depression and there's some levels that can be really devastating mm. in your life. You know, I mean, in really, and it can be sometimes, you know, chronic chronic thing um i i get it sometimes i get like suddenly boom you know like i get these uh feelings of like depression you know suddenly you know and and then it's sometimes it's hard to to really kind of control you know like be like boom, you know like some kind of anxiety or depression it can happen you know and um i feel really it's a, it's an opportunity it's an opportunity to get to know our mind mm -hmm. So instead of seeing it as something bad, something negative, something that, that, that you should be unhappy about, you know, it's about saying, well, this is an opportunity. How can I use this as a tool to, to really relate to myself? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's, it's difficult, very difficult. And most of the time, it's, it's, it's really about giving yourself space. You know, there's the same space. The moment you stop thinking, all your problems disappear, which is true, actually, <laughs> because your problems are a result of your thinking. Mm. And the way you're thinking, or the way your attitude, the, 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 the attitude you have for somebody, for someone's suffering can be another person's uh, joy, you know, I mean, it depends. It's all really, really relative. You know, and I think, yes, if it's a serious type of depression, it's really important to have therapy. It's really important to ask for help. It's very important to receive um, support from your friends and from the people that you know. Because um, those are the real uh, therapists, you know, the close people, people that you know, know you, that love you, that 
care for you. Um, of course, not everybody has someone. You know, there's many people who are completely alone, or they think they're alone, but they're with themselves. You know, we are our own our own company, and really our only company. You know, because uh, we are isolated in a way. I mean, in this body, we are isolated. You know, I mean, I can express myself to the five senses. I can, you know, say words or play music or do some kind of action. You know, like uh, or cook it, say, a meal, you know, and put a lot of love in the meal or, or make it drawing and present it to you or write a poem or, or, you know, but in the end, we're isolated. You know, I mean, the only means for me to communicate is through these five senses mm -hmm. for you to understand me or to relate to me. So in the end, we are not capable of, of learning to be with our own company and to enjoy our company the most is we should be, uh, we, or we are our best friend, our own best friend. Then we have big problem, you know, and many times I think depression is based on really not being able to understand the true meaning of life, the true aspect of one's own true nature, of one's own mind, you know. So I think what, uh, Dharma can help you a lot of, in, in, in understanding that. So I do recommend to have a, a basic understanding of one's own nature, you know, the, the, the nature of the mind, mind science, uh, like yeah. his own. So, I mean, just sticking to the topic of depression, one of the major reasons of our depression seems to be that we don't have an end to our cravings and desires that we keep running away from that we keep running to from one desire to the other desire from one place to the other place one of the places one of the addictions that we the world especially in the modern cities of 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 the world not just indian india europe france U us or wherever one of the addictions that we run to is the sex that we run to our sexual addictions a lot there are so many crimes, so many hearts get broken because of infidelity, because of our affairs, because of our attachments to sex. So much of depression and suffering comes out of sex. So what you would say about this addiction of sex and how? what, what is the healthiest attitude of looking at sex? Because there's an attitude of renunciation as well that exists in Buddhism. Yeah, but that concept of renunciation sometimes is misunderstood. In Tibetan, you call it, they call it Nyejung. And uh, it's, uh, I think there's different aspects of that word. It's not about saying, now I'm, uh, I'm not going to do any of the things that I love. You know, it's not, and also you said sex brings many problems. It's not sex that brings problems. You know, it's the attitude towards sex. It's the attachment behind that sex. Mm. It's the grasping, the clinging, the desire, that that craving. You know, that 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 that, that the, the unleashing the mind, that mind. You know, because we we give it, we let it roam free, in a sense. There is no kind of understanding of the real meaning of what sex is. Sex is actual sacred intimacy intimacy you know it's a creation of a life actually to, when you think about it you know, that is the beginning of life that's how life is created so the whole universe maybe started from sex i mean who knows i mean if if you know if the universe represents you know from small to big you know i mean like if you look at the eyes the eyes have the same shape of the cosmos right I mean, who knows? Maybe we are part, we're just a small, tiny, whatever, living inside the stomach of some giant. You know, and it's so, so, so big. Because actually the universe represents what we see here. Quantum mechanics is the same. There's so much space in between anything that we think is solid. There's a lot of space. So because, because, because of that aspect, I feel that maybe sometimes, you know, maybe the whole universe was created, you know, by that, by making love. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. I mean, I definitely don't know. But I, I do know that many times the mind does create a reality that doesn't really 
it's not applicable to the real reality. It's just a, a fantasy. That's an, an illusion. You know, so we grasp, we grasp, grasp, grasp that, that illusion, but uh, we don't really want to recognize that it's an illusion. Because for us, it's easier to not be big, you know, to not be universal, to not be the real deal. We, it's easier to be tiny and insignificant and ignorant than to really become your own true potential. It's much easier you know, to, be, to be a follower than to be a leader. You know, because also maybe because we've been educated in that way. You know, we, 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 do, we are educated to work. We're not really educated to live, you know, so already that is an aspect it does not really help, you know, to really understand that part of oneself. So I don't know. I'm really. I feel. I feel terrible to 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 know. I mean, it's terrible all the crimes that are committed from from this clinging and attachment towards sex, you know. Or it's not really sex. It's it's. I think it's almost like a. I mean, obviously, when you see the animals, they do have an instinct, you know, of of that kind of activity. Mm. But the mind of the human is much worse because we have that consciousness behind it, that ability to recognize, you know, a co cognitive uh, understanding uh, of differentiation. So that is, uh, we don't ha really have an excuse. It's not like the animals, you know, a tiger, you know, he created the karma to be stuck as a tiger or much worse. So therefore he's actually creating suffering in order to survive. So he's constantly creating the karma to continue living as a tiger or worse. Because just in order to survive, he has to kill and create suffering. Mm. You know, that's the cause and effect of, of samsara. You know, we are in a, in a cycle, a vicious cycle, a self condemnation cycle based on attachment. So yes, you have touched the, the root of, of the cause for most of the suffering. But it's created by oneself. So it starts with one, we start the, the cause and the result, we have to live this, the result too. You know, I mean, eventually I'm gonna die and the day, I'm going, the day I'm going to die, I'll be living that, that experience. And I know I will one day live it, that experience. And because I know, I value a hundred million times more what I'm living. And the mystery of what's going to happen when I die is awesome. It makes life awesome. But if I knew exactly what was going to die and when I'm going to die, man, it would be so boring. I wouldn't do anything. I would just be, I don't know what I would do. I, I would... Pfft. It'd be weird, you know, just to think about a life like that. And so for me, the, the mystery of, of life is beautiful. You know, it does give me a type of respect and a type of awe and a type of appreciation and gratitude to what is happening right now because life is happening. I mean, I have love going through my veins, you know. It's a combination of oxygen and blood and electric impulses from the heart. I mean, it's, there's a million gazillion aspects for us to live every second. You know, from so many centuries, from so many different dimensions and times, you know, all these generations that came before us that, that you know, created a million gazillion things that we are experiencing now. And thanks to that, we, we, we are able to, to live this. You know, if you don't mean I have the roof, I have the fire, I have, you know, the... the Everything, you know, the sofa, the, the clothes, you know, like there's so many things that is just the result of the of the love of the people, you know. Someone has had to do it, has had to put their mind into it and, and make the effort and put this give this space, the energy and the time for this to be able to be available to me. It doesn't mean that I own it. I mean I don't even own my body. Mm -hmm. Somebody and I don't have my body. Somebody comes shoots me and I don't have my body anymore. What is it? It's gone. It becomes worm dust again. It becomes sawdust again, you know? So uh, worm food, sorry, <laughs> worm dust. <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, that's really the reality, you know? And, and I, uh, maybe this could be my last talk. Maybe tomorrow I'm dead, who knows? Or, or not, you know? But life is, 
it's always happening. And when we go to sleep, we, it's a type of death. It's, it's a representation, you know, one day is a representation of one life. And when, when you're born, you, you, you wake up and you are fresh and you're like, wow, you're eager, maybe. Maybe not everybody's eager in the morning. I am. <laughs> and at night, you know, you get tired, you get, uh, you know, groggy and you eventually you have to go to sleep. You have to lie down and close your eyes. Lama Zopa doesn't. Lama Zopa Remuzi doesn't. <laughs> He doesn't need to sleep. He, he meditates all night. So, wow, that's amazing. Personally, me, I can't. I need at least six hours of sleep minimum. Otherwise, I become really grumpy. And I need food in my stomach. Then if not, I also become grumpy. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, these are all aspects of love, you know, and love is, that life is love, you know I mean? It's happening all the time. You know, we talk about, oh, love made me suffer. You know, or sex is bad because it's, 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 it's whatever, it's violence or it's, I don't know. You, I mean, you can have all kinds of ideas about all kinds of things. It doesn't really matter. It's not relevant because it's not, it's not really based on, on the true concept that we're living right now, you know. And what we're living right now doesn't have a concept, doesn't have an idea. It's not, it's not a, something that you can put into words. It's something you can live. I can't, ex I can't give you the information of what chocolate tastes like. You, know, you mm. have to take the chocolate and taste it. Right? Mm. So it's the same way, you know. You can't, I can't teach, nobody can teach me, and I can't teach anybody unless I want to learn or they want to learn. You know, so the, the, the first guru is the inner guru that, that is the one who learns. It's the one who has, who has the experience. You know? And of course, and then there's the outer guru, which is part of the inner guru as well. Because we relate. Anyways, that's another story. Um, in India and also all over the world, Children are learning skills, but the study of warm heartedness and kindness seems to be lost. Do you think that Buddhism could develop some courses for uh, children as well? And what, what, what advice would you give to parents? So have you heard of C learning by his holiness, the Dalai Lama? He, uh, this is a collaboration with the Emory University. Yes, yeah, I've heard of it. The first convention happened in, in Delhi, and I was there. Actually, I, I got a, an amazing hug from His Holiness Dalai Lama in that convention, which I'll never forget. And uh, it's really special. Sea learning, social, ethical, and and um, so social, ethical, and uh, emotional learning. And uh, it's very similar to universal education, also uh, by Lama Yeshe. They have the, the. It's very different, also at the same time. But, um, but the basis is the same, you know, and that's, I really think uh, what his own is, is 100% right when he says that the, the future is uh, education. You know, it's very difficult to really have faith in humanity if, if we're not able to educate the future generations properly. Because if they have to learn from example, then goodbye. Mm. At least up to now. It's very difficult, you know, because we just live in the in the in the now. You know, I want I want money now, so I don't really care about tomorrow or anybody else, and not even my own children sometimes, which is quite um, worrying. But that's how it is, you know. Sometimes I even think that maybe humanity is just destined to auto destroy themselves, you know, and that's it, and that's that, and we are just living a glimpse of an existence of something so weird, you know, an anomaly in the universe, which is humanity. And we are just living that glimpse and everything will just disappear eventually. And that's impermanence. Um, or maybe it will happen again in another aspect in a different way. Or not. Or maybe humanity is going to be able to really become more conscious and, and understand that if we continue like this, there's going to be no kind of future for us because we also we depend on 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 the variety you know of of different species you know and already you know there's so many species are dying even the amazon if if it's so easy for the amazon to just disappear because the soil it doesn't really have a, a, a 
it's like it's very sandy, you know. So if there's some fires and like that for it to regrow, it's very difficult. You know, this mm -hmm. is the way it was. And there's huge amount of medicine coming from the Amazon. Huge amount. Very important medicine. So, anyways, like that, there's many aspects like that, you know, and uh, we know we it's uncertain, but the same way our life is uncertain also. But within that uncertainty, we really have to be able to be aware that, that, there, that there is no future if we continue like this. So, at least to try to do something, you know, and I think that, you know, planting a tree is a great, great, great concept. And it's part of also education, you know, to really learn how to plan and how to, you know, receive. Because life is about giving and receiving. It's an exchange. You plant a tree and then you receive the fruits, you know, or, or anything, you know, like a vegetable. Because really the energy of the vegetable is coming from the sun. Mm. And we are eating it. That the animals eat from the vegetables that we see from the sun. You know, so I mean, obviously, you can go directly to the sun and eat from prana, you know, which some people do. <laughs> you know, you have to be barefoot for that and look directly in the sun <laughs> when it's like coming out and going down. I've tried it myself, but I like to eat my. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to survive. You know, I mean, I think you really need a lot of dedication. Um, but um, that's the thing, you know, it's really to, to, to really understand that, that the, the ground is very important. You know, the ground is essential <laughs> in our life. And many times, you know, these days in the city, some kids don't even know where the oranges grow from. They think the oranges just appear in a supermarket, in a box. They're man-made, maybe. They, maybe they make them in a, a factory, you know. They don't know they come from a tree. You know, and even like some children, you know, in a, in a, in the in a car window, they do like that, like they're trying to like as if it's like some screen, the car window, and it's like that's a reality in the head. You know, that's it's very serious. You know, and we don't really know the consequences of the new generation. There are the iPad and in like iPad generation. You know, like there's there's there's, there's trolleys with the thing to put the iPad in. Well. Already designed, or send, or to eat, and with it, and you connect it there. Well, for the baby, while he eats, to to while you feed them, so that they there when they're in the car, they're watching. When they're in the toilet, you know, it's like it's like you're disconnecting children already from their own from the real reality, you know. And actually, you think it's gonna be easier. It's easier, you know. Oh, let me just put the movie for the kids so that you know, so I can work, or I can do this, or I can relax, or whatever. It's gonna, it's easier. No, it's not easier. In the long run is going to be worse and worse and worse and worse. Mm. There's because the kid becomes neurotic. Yeah, because really, the, screen, the effect the screen has on the baby's brain is similar to cocaine on an adult's brain. Oh. That's the example that I've read in the book. So, you know, it's quite a shocking and worrying. <laughs> it becomes an addiction. And also, you know, the, the, if, the, if, if a baby or a child loses... Um, touch with reality already we have a, you know it's, it, it's a worse situation than already that you know what what when we have is we're already in, lost touch with reality but we are like this is like making this the, the this the problem double double problem you know double bad so that's i think very important you know to really be with the kids, you know, to give quality time, to really understand what, what, what's the important thing to teach a child is the values, the true inner values, you know, the, the real goal that you're going that you, that what's really valuable, it's not about money, you know, because this, some people are so poor that all they have is money. And uh, that's very sad, you know, very sad. So really, the, what the most valuable thing that we have is is our values, <laughs> and I think the word says it, right? <laughs> Your values are what, what's most valuable. Some people may say it's time, but time is just a concept; it's change. And if we don't if we don't have good values, and the, 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 our attitude toward change will just bring us suffering. Is will be suffering. Oh, I'm old. Or I look bad. Or I'm this. Or I'm that. Oh, oh. Then you know I'm suffering. 
you know, but it doesn't really matter. For some people, you may be, be beautiful. For some other people, you may be ugly, but, you know, it doesn't really matter because what you are is just flesh and bone. And uh, eventually, you just be, you know, uh, worm food, right? <laughs> or, 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 you know, just ash. <laughs> I want to be planted as a tree, you know, just in case, you know, I haven't said it before. I would really like an oak would be good or a redwood or a baobab tree or something like that. It would be great. You know, to, to put my body, for the tree to use their body as uh, the means to grow, at least to start growing, you know, as food. That would be good, you know. At least you can see the tree, right? And the tree gives oxygen. And then you can hug the tree, like, oh, Osel, we miss you. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, that's so nice. Are you taking me? Don't take me take me here. <laughs> Who knows where I'll be, you know, like, who knows where we're going? I don't know. Reincarnation, I'm sure I believe in his wholeness. I really believe. But it's it's a fantasy also. You know, life is a fantasy. You know, I mean, what, it, I mean, you can say, no, it's always oh, very serious. It's really serious. Yeah, well, I mean, war is serious. And war is a fantasy. A country is a fantasy. If you can show me the borders, the natural borders of the country, you know, a non-man-made decision, or, you know, then, okay, but uh, any border is invented. Any religion started off as a cult. You know, I mean, it's very easy to believe in something, you know, but really the truth is, is that, you know, it's all a fantasy in a way, what we believe in, you know. <laughs> What's money? Money is we just oh well, it was gold and it was this and then it was that and then before it was seashells, you know, seashells was the way people used to. There's a point where seashells were very very valuable, you know. Um, but that's the thing. It's just to be able. It's like that's why re renunciation is linked to that concept. The real renunciation. It's not about like oh I don't want. I'm not gonna do. I just have to maintain in the cave forever, until my beard grows really really long. You know, and then suddenly a flash will happen and now I will understand everything. It doesn't work like that. You know, you have to be realistic. You know, so... So really, it's... Nejum or renunciation is linked like that. It's to understand the reality of things. You know? It's like, okay, we... 200,000 people may go to war and they're all strangers between themselves. But they fight for one belief, which is country which is real because of that belief, you know, because there's another country that believes the same and the other country is maybe more powerful. Mm -hmm. So they will attack and conquer this country and it becomes completely real. But it only becomes real because every single person believes in it, in that fantasy. But that fantasy is not real. It's just a concept. And then like that, we're full, our life is full of that. And we, we pass it on from generation to generation to generation. And we take it so seriously. Your whole life, you just dedicated to that. And maybe the moment right before you die, you realize, oh, you have that thought, but it's too late. You know, so it's good to talk about these things now. It's good to break those barriers. It's good to open your mind and liberate yourself from, from, from the reins of suffering, of self, self-created suffering, really. Mm -hmm. Many times I think it comes from that, you know, from, from knowing deep down inside that there's something wrong, but then wanting to follow society because you want to belong, right? So there's a conflict there. And I think many depressions come from that. So anyways, I forgot the question, but anyway, <laughs> I hope I answered the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. There are many, many kids in India and maybe elsewhere as well who've become addicted to drugs, alcohol, and some really hard drugs as well. It's a real problem, especially in the urban cities. I mean, people abuse marijuana, people use, abuse alcohol on a daily basis a lot as well, and that's not good for your mental health for sure. I don't really know my question here, but what do you think in your experience, what is there, what could they do, the parents and the children in this case? Well, you know, there's a, there's a very uh, nice example I really like in, uh, in the north of Europe, you know, I think Sweden or Norway, these countries, you know, uh, where they, they, the strategy towards uh, junkies is very different from the rest of the world. You know, so most of the, in most places, uh, societies or, or, or systems, 
you know, they just, it's like a rejection. They reject. It's like outcasts. In India, you know, you call the untouchables, right? Like some outcasts, you know, you're out from the society. You know, you belong together, but you, in society, you are unaccepted. This concept is mainly the reason why these people become junkies or addicts, because they don't have a, an orientation or a direction or a purpose. And they don't have a feeling of belonging. That's really the issue. Mm. That's the problem, the cause. The symptom is addiction. Anything, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Depending on the person, you know. Um, so the strategy that these countries they came up with is, for example, in the case of the junkies, they would give them heroin. They were like, okay, here, here you go. We'll give you the, the purest, the best heroin for free. We give you the, the needles, everything so you to do it. We give you a place to do it. Uh, you know, clean, you know, uh, all these aspects of a place where they can do it properly and in a safe zone, clean environment, all these aspects. And at the same time, we're also going to offer you the opportunity to, to be part of society, you know, so like study, work, mm. community, food, everything. So what happened, 90, 99% or a huge amount, like most of everyone, Stop becoming being junkies because suddenly there was no purpose in being a junkie. There's no purpose. They, they, were, they had, you know, for them it was much more interesting. Like, oh, I have, I have an opportunity to learn and to be to have, get a job, do something for society, to be in part of a community. Oh, that, that's what I want, you know. So instinctively they lost that addiction. That addiction just disappears. Mm. That addiction only stays in place when you have that conflict within you of not belonging, not having a purpose, of not having a true direction or, or you're scared of your own potential you know or you're in pain and you, you want to shut down that pain hmm. so in, by helping you being functional then that pain becomes much less so then the addiction becomes much less and slowly your attitude and the way you're living slowly creates a cause for you to be not unhappy and that way you can slowly start becoming happy or being happy and being able to offer more to society and to your friends and really being a, a much nicer, more stable, more joyful person, more healthy and active. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not just about, oh, this is bad and you're bad because you're doing it. It's more about like, why are you doing it? And how can I help you to understand the root cause of why you're doing it? And so that, so we neutralize the whole actual problem. Mm. You know, and, and I think that also in the, it starts in the family too, you know, because if the family shuns someone because they smoke marijuana, then that could become a cause, a, a direct cause for them to eventually smoke you know, crack cocaine or crystal meth or, or, or you know, or, or, or take a heroin. So, but instead maybe it's the family kind of like accepted, like, okay, you smoke marijuana, well, that's up to you, you're responsible, you know, we accept you the same way, we still love you the same way, there's no problem. Then maybe the person eventually just loses interest. I mean, they just their, their interest or the, the channel where they want to channel their energy and their focus it goes in a different way because it's not focused on my pain and me, my rejection, this that da, 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 blah 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 blah. Because we are work like that, you know. We work on on patterns, on habits. You know, we repeat. You know, so it's very easy to fall prey to these habits and patterns. So that's why it's also a responsibility as a as a father for me, you know, and also as a as a as a as a teacher <laughs> or, or virtuous friend. I'm not very virtuous, but I, I can be a friend. We wanted to ask you about the Global Tree Initiative. So it's a, a project that you've started, and we'd like to know more about what is the future of the Global Tree Initiative. What are you planning, and um, how and why should would it be good for people to become a part of it? Well, the Global Tree Initiative, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's about planting trees, obviously. And I think uh, the tree, planting a tree is, is a great practice, you know, of love because it's unconditional. You're not planting a tree for yourself. You're planting it for the future generation. You know, so that's already an act of love, kindness, of compassion, of understanding. You also have to educate yourself to understand that 
that the tree that you're planting will survive in 15 to 20 years. So climate change is a very important factor. So that helps you to inform yourself, to, to situate yourself from here to 20 years, the situation to understand how vital, how important it is right now to start planting trees. At least that's one very small aspect, something much larger, you know, but we have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So at least if you, if you plant one tree, that tree will be there creating, producing oxygen, you know, and helping bring rain and, and, and protecting the soil. There's so many different, so many different aspects, you know, like in, in different universes all over the place and different times, you know what I mean? Like maybe a tree can live up to 2,000, 4,000 years and, uh, and you what, you live nothing. <laughs> 80 years, 90, 100, 200. 200 is maybe, <laughs> but at least people that live 200, I think. <laughs> but you know, it's it's about really understanding that you're nothing, you know, and you're something at least, you know, so you're proud because you are, but you're humble because you belong, you know, and uh, so I think planting a tree is a type of uh, uh, gratitude, saying thank you, and also saying, Saying, you know, I also, I want to also, you know, offer something in return that will continue. It's I don't know, it's it's something very beautiful, you know, it's very romantic, very poetic. And that thing is a great representation of, of Dharma and love and uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. So so do it, plant a tree, you know, it's free. You just plant it. And you just write the number. You you write, you fill up the the questionnaire, and then we all dedicate together the trees to like as long as the Dalai Lama's long life or different different causes and people and whatever. But at least you know we are starting to do something together, and it's not. And one of the things that I think is very interesting about uh, GTI, uh, we're not sure yet, but uh, I think maybe to keep it money free. You know, no money involved. So we would have to get the finance from another place. You know, we would have to finance ourselves in order to really run it. But all the trees planted would be from volunteer, voluntary kind of expression. You know, and people would come and say, you know, I want to plant this morning trees. I want to dedicate these trees. So it's like a very kind of collective thing, very... Um, Nobody expects anything in return because you do it. You do it yourself, and um, it's a very free kind of non-judgmental, non—you know—money, you know, thing. I don't know. Because there's a lot of judgment always, you know, and uh, and I think it's good to at least try to avoid, you know, giving space for those things to happen. Because in the end, all you create is, uh, you know bad imprints in other people's minds, you know. If GTI receives I don't know, twenty million dollars and you know people may get bad impression in their mind. Even if we plant the uh, two hundred million trees. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. You know, we don't want to create bad imprints. We want to help, you know, people to create good imprints. So I don't know. I don't I I, th I and the more I think about it, I think it's good to have collaborations with other organizations that do involve, have money involved. But I think GTI as an organization should be money free. But anyways, this is something I'm just talking about right now because it just came to me. But it's been a, a feeling that I've had for a long time. So I just take this opportunity to make it official. <laughs> Sorry, Jackie. <laughs> you would ask Earlier, you had mentioned something about stupas and trees. Would you yeah. be willing to elaborate a little bit about that? Well, stupa is also a karmic thing, you know, and the trees is also a karmic thing. So I think that's the relationship between the two. It's just the way you see it, maybe it's very different because one is a spiritual vision and the other one is a more kind of ecological vision. You know? <laughs> but the, the, the concept is the same. That's why I like to use the same name. If you have to pick, let's say, three initiatives that we all should work on, except and besides planting a tree, what do you think those three initiatives would be? Well, I think the first initiative would be uh, be aware of your own bullshit. 
I think that if we all start doing that, then that's going to help a lot, you know, because I think we are all full of, you know, a lot of uh, trickster stuff in our minds, you know, like we feed ourselves stuff that is not real. So the earlier we are aware of that and we clarify with ourselves, you know, and we take responsibility, I think that's going to be very beneficial. So every day, you know, to be really always aware and ready and observing the mind when it comes like, ah, stop right there. Hey, no, you see, I saw, and then look for the cause. Where does it come from? Follow that mind stream. Follow it all the way to that desire, that, you know, that attachment. And then where did that come from? Where is that? Oh, the ego. And where is the ego? And oh, that's linked to the identification. Why is identification there? It's because of me, I, and you know, this, this desire to be, you know, um, recognized, you know, desire to be bigger than what you think you are, you know, but actually you're way bigger than you can ever imagine you are. You know, so it's a, there's always this kind of small conflict, you know, in, in the subtle minds and, and the, the subconscious and the more kind of like, you know, aware mind. <laughs> so there's uh, many, many, many aspects in that. But I think that's one of the important parts is that, you know, and uh, I think the second thing would be to, to be grateful. Because I think the gratitude is, is what you want to plant in your heart. That's, that's really the basis for a very happy life and to be a much better person in the long run. So, so gratitude. And I think the third one is uh, to, to, to be dedicated, you know, to be dedicated to anything that you love. If you have a passion, if you love something, you know, to dedicate time to that, you know. Don't be like, uh, you know, like, like be true to yourself. Be true to yourself, you know, be a good friend to yourself. You know, even if you have peer pressure or whatever, you know, if you want to follow your instinct, you want to feel, follow your passion, go for it, you know. It's not your problem, it's their problem that they don't want to accept who you are, you know. I mean, that's, that's how it is. You know, it's not, you don't want to live their life, you want to live your life. And it's you who are going to live it eventually. I mean, that was how I, I made the decision of leaving the monastery. Yeah, I, I'm the one who's going to have to live the, 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 you know, my life. It's not nobody else. Everybody else would like me to be, you know, a monk and, and study dharma and get my doctorate and sit on the throne and teach Buddhism, you know. But that's their concept. That's their idea. But they don't have to live that. You know, that's just an idealization that they have, which is completely unrealistic. So I have to live that, you know. <laughs> So I, I, I'm, I decide to be egoist a little bit. So that's also in a way self-compassion you know, because you're also being aware of, you know, being realistic in that sense. You know, otherwise maybe I'll, be, I'll feel bitter or, or not, I don't know, but at least I took the decision at that moment which I felt was the most logical. And, uh, and yeah, I just followed my, my, my heart and my instinct and, uh, and I don't regret, but that, I think that's very important. You know, it does take a, a lot of um, effort and belief in oneself and also a risk, you know, like it's almost like a gamble sometimes, you know, but life is a gamble anyway. So if you don't take risks, sometimes you never really do anything, you know, and if you don't mis make mistakes, for sure you're not doing anything. Don't make mistakes and you're not doing absolutely anything. So... Making mistakes is a very good sign, you know, and I think if you don't take risks, then what's, why are you living? You know, if, you, if you're scared of death, then you're scared of life. It's like that. Because death and life are, are linked, you know. If the moment you accept death, then you, then you accept life. You can, live, you can live fully. And only the moment you, you actually accept death can you really live fully. As long as you're scared of death, Oh, I should I shouldn't go. Oh, anything this can happen or that can happen. Oh, huh, huh. then you're limiting yourself. You know, you're not really alive. You're just waiting to die, basically. So come on, you know, just be realistic, and then and be happy, be joyful. You know, and the problems really are much smaller than you think. Mm. As long as you're self-centered, yes, your problems will be huge, and as long as you see them as huge, you always be smaller than your problems and you will never be able to, you know, overcome them. The good mantra is I'm bigger than my problems. That's a great mantra. Or whatever you want to say, you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's up to you. You know, it's what helps you to really 
move forward to what you think or feel or believe that is the, 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 the right step forward. Nobody can say that to you. It's easy to say, oh, please tell me what I have to do. I'll just do that. You know, it's very easy to say that. But actually, it's much more difficult to do that than to follow your own instinct in your heart and then, you know, take responsibility. It's much easier, actually, in the long run, because in the long run, you're, you're going to be much, much, much more happy and fulfill. You have, have a much more fulfilling life. And you can also be the example. So, but of course, you have to take responsibility. You know, I mean, that's what we are here for. We are here to learn and to love to understand about love. So my last question was, uh, what are the solutions you can offer to the world uh, which is struggling with climate change and the water crisis and other uh, environmental dangers and just- What are the solutions? Problems? Yeah, so what are some like, what, what solutions would you recommend? So one of the solution and that is my last question as well. I think that ties well with this one as well that one of the solution that many people are saying is to curb your meat intake, that become a vegan or at least a vegetarian. That would be a very good solution to solve this excessive carbon dioxide crisis. Where do you stand on that? And maybe- well, well, First of all, we have to take care of the soil. That's really important because two thirds of the planet is becoming a desert. You know? So I think that's, because also it's not just about trees, and bushes and, and, and grass. You know, as the more variety you have, the better. And that also, you know, the plants do absorb CO2 and take it down to the roots and it's stored in the ground as energy because CO2 really is energy. It's not that it's good or bad, you know, it's energy. It's just the way, you know, we see it because it does affect, you know, it does create the greenhouse effect and all that. But, um, and it's not also about the extremes. You know, it's like, oh, if the whole plant went vegan, also that wouldn't work out, I guess. I don't know, you know. It's really about having the the, the 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 balance, you know. For example, I try to eat meat maybe twice a week max, you know, and if I can, maybe twice a month, you know. But at least, you know, and, and then I try to not pay for. I mean, if I could, because uh, it's very it's hypocritical actually, you know, because if you're not killing the animal but you're eating the meat that someone else killed, you know, and then uh, you're incapable of killing the animal. I'm incapable of killing an animal, right? but I will eat the meat. But that's also a cultural thing, you know, because as a child, you know, you grow up maybe eating meat or not. Just think about it. India is 75% vegetarian. And imagine if that 75% was as, as meat eating as Argentina, for example, and then Argentina, they eat so much meat. You know, so it's, just imagine, you know, that, that the impact they, will be terrible, you know. So I think f on one side, it's, it's really, really, really good. I mean, I, I would love to go be vegetarian right now. I haven't been, I'm not evolved enough, maybe, in that sense, to become a vegetarian because I, I really love meat. I really enjoy eating meat, even though it goes against my principles. But, um, and yes, I'm a hypocrite, for sure, 100%. But, um. I recommend if you, if you, like me, for people like me, I would recommend maybe maximum twice a week or maybe twice a month to eat meat if you really have to eat meat. Otherwise, um, I think it's a great thing to, but if you are vegan, then really make sure about the diet, really inform yourself, really learn about the, how to do the nutritious aspects and really to have a very big, good range of variety of of nutrition that will really cover everything you need. I think that's very important, you know, because vegan can be risky also in the long run if you don't do it properly. And that uh, being vegetarian is, is also good, you know, very good. But it's not about the extreme, oh, let's all become vegans, you know, so that's the way we're going to save the world. And then maybe it's another problem. It's more about the attitude, you know, so, uh, you know, it's about in, in, in Sanskrit, I think they call it anisha, right? Anicca means equanimity. So I think it's really about the equanimity, about the balance. You know, even water, if you drink too much water, it kills you. If there's too much water, it will kill you. There's floods, there's this, there's that, you know, so it's, but you need water to live. So it's not that water is bad. 
You know, I mean, it's, I mean, we as homo sapiens, we've been eating meat for 40,000 years. So our body is quite um, designed to eat meat, you know, so it's not like suddenly, oh, if, if you have, you know, the, the custom of eating meat to cut suddenly from one day to another, I don't even know if it's healthy either, you know, even though the intention is good. So that's also, it's, it's not about, oh, I'm going to have compassion and now I'm just going to think about all certain things and I'm going to forget about myself and I'm just going to get sick because I'm working so hard for everybody that I'm just going to forget about myself and I become sick, you know, from overworking and not eating properly. You know, that's not the compassion. That's not real practice. I mean, of course, it's amazing, but you really have to be able to channel it properly. You know? So sometimes it's good to procrastinate, take a break, breathe, take time sometimes for yourself, do the things that you love, do the things that fill you, you know, and then, you know, so you really have to have a balance. Life is about the balance. It's about learning about the balance of love. Because the universe may seem chaotic, but within that chaos, there is an order. So I think that that applies to everybody in a way. You know, we may seem to be, you know, chaotic or, or, or see ourselves as chaotic. But again, it's just a concept. You know, it's really the attitude that you have, the intention. Is the intention a, an intention of wanting to help other sentient beings or is it the intention of just wanting to be happy you? And if it's the latter, then you're going to have problems. You're going to suffer. Because with that intention, you can never be happy. So that's a universal law. Mm. It applies to everybody. <laughs> we've, all, we've actually taken like more than we asked for your time. So thank you so much for that. And we, if 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 we could, so thank you so much again. If we could, could we ask you for a small dedication, maybe for all our listeners and for the CKSL as well? ทอดเงินสัญญาธรรมเนี่ยมาเยอะปานมีเยอะเจ๊เกี่ยวอะไรเงี้ยบารามีบารามีบารายอ่ะคนเนี่ยคนเดียวเพราะว่าโชคเก